Hello and welcome to Ben Church's online worship service for May the 7th, 2023. We're so glad you joined us. You know, here at Ben Church, we believe that every human being is a child of God. And no matter where you are on your faith journey, you are welcome and affirmed here at Ben Church. You know, the wheel of the year keeps on turning. Summer will fade into fall and winter melts into spring and nature sings a never-ending story of life, death, and renewal. Butterflies show us how to unwrap the gifts of everyday life when they break forth from their chrysalises as new creations. We celebrate the effort that breaking into new life takes as we awaken to the rich blessings of this present day. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Holy God, word made flesh, let us come to this word open to being surprised, silence our agendas, banish our assumptions, cast out our casual detachment. We know that you can, we pray that you will, and we wait with great anticipation. Amen. Scripture reading comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 6, verses 5 through 11. <clears throat> For if we have been united in a death like Christ's, we will certainly be so in the resurrection. This we know, that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be destroyed, and we may no longer be enslaved to sin. The woman or man who has died is free from sin, but if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die. Death no longer has dominion over him. For dying, he died once to sin. In living, he lives to God. So also should you consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Dory. So, um, good to see your faces here today on this first Sunday in May. Say hello to the people who will watch us at home. Hi. I don't always do that. I sometimes forget. So. But they like to know that we know them. We love you all. We understand. So, <laughs> grace wins. You know that. Grace wins. Resurrection is real. Amen? So I, I uh, as we were talking about this scripture, I realized that I have preached on Romans in the 11 years that I've been preaching every Sunday exactly once. <laughs> I have avoided it for a reason. But once I started uh, reading again this week, I got so excited um, because I have avoided this book for no good reason. It's beautiful. It has a lot to tell us. There's a lot to unpack that you can't unpack in a 15 minutes or then on Sunday, but I'm going to go for it. So uh, first of all, I want to say we're talking about sin, which is a loaded concept. But I just want to remind you that sin is literally missing the mark in the Greek. It's, it's turning away from the creator. It's not a list of uh, what some Puritan thought was immoral uh, 500 years ago, and we have to go through that. In biblical thought, sin and evil are seen in terms of injustice, that is, of a fracturing of the social and human fabric. Amen? Good. So let me ask you a question. Have you ever felt so bad about something you said or did or did not do that you thought no one, least of all God, could forgive you? Is anyone else? Yeah. Yeah. So the story I'm about to tell you, you might think is really small and silly, but when it happened to me, it was, was crushing. And I, I talked to my husband who said I could tell this story. So I almost broke up with the love of my life when I was 19 because instead of buying him a gift for our one year dating anniversary, I bought Sinead O'Connor tickets. 
He, on the other hand, surprised me. He came to my house, woke me up early. He took me up into a balloon. Oh my gosh. Then after the balloon, we had this beautiful day out by the pool at his parents' house. Then we lived in Spring, Texas, which is a suburb of Houston. He took me out to a really fancy dinner in downtown Houston. And then he gave me this promise ring. In my defense, <laughs> Sinead O'Connor had this really awesome concert and it was right next to my dorm room and my best friend was going and she got the tickets and so I had to give her money for the tickets because I thought I would have more money. And I did make him a collage of pictures of our first year together, which is still hanging in our bedroom, but it wasn't ready on that day. <laughs> oh my gosh, y'all, I felt terrible. I could still, oh, the guilt was crushing. He'd clearly thought about this anniversary way more than I had. And I felt sick to my stomach about it for months. I really almost broke up with him because I could not deal with the shame and the guilt I felt about it. I did, so I wouldn't have to deal with him because I felt so bad. Now you should know he forgave me. Our 30th wedding anniversary is next month. But I really, I almost broke up with him because I could not face the shame that I felt that I was a terrible person for not thinking about my one year dating anniversary with my cute boyfriend. Now we know that in the history of Christianity, there has been more than our share of focusing on shame and guilt and sin, feeling bad, tortured even because God died on a cross to take our sins away. And there have been teachings across almost all Christian sects that focus on how bad we should feel about ourselves for not living up to God's expectations. And this morning, as I was finishing, I read Richard Moore's meditation, which he said, we live not just in an age of anxiety, but also in a time of significant shame. I find very few people who do not feel inadequate, stupid, dirty, or unworthy. When people come to me for counseling or confession, they always express in one way or another, if people only knew the things I think, the things I've done, the things I've said, the things I want to do, who would love me? We all have this terrible feeling of a fundamental unworthiness, and it takes many different forms, but somehow it appears in each of our lives, even if we don't acknowledge it. He goes on, guilt, I am told, is about things we have done or not done, but our shame is about the primal emptiness of our very being. Shame is not about what we have done, but about who we are and who we are not, Guilt is a moral question, but shame, foundational shame at least, has to do with our very being itself. It is not resolved by changing behavior as much as by changing our very self-image, our alignment with the universe. Shame is not about what we do, but where we abide. And truly, we find that way of thinking everywhere. But... When we read Paul's letter to the Romans, if we follow the argument through this very complex letter, if we really listen, then we are released. We are made free to live our lives with joy and grateful appreciation for the resurrection, abundant life that we have been offered. Amen? We can be free, uh, free of, of shame and guilt. We can be free. And we know this in part as Methodists because you may remember on May 24th, 1738, 
John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement at the age of 35, finally understood grace. It says, Wesley reluctantly, <laughs> I love when the pastor's like, oh, I gotta get a Bible study. Wesley reluctantly attended a group meeting that evening on Aldersgate Street in London. And as he heard a reading from Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans, he felt changed, transformed. Wesley wrote in his journal that at about 8.45 p.m., while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. <laughs> I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Paul's letter to the Romans is a foundational Christian document, and its arguments are long and intricate, but... Part of that argument is that no one is better than anyone else, that we are all welcome at the table to the party because God is gracious always. Amen? Amen. So a little background. Paul, in this letter, is introducing himself to the Roman churches. These are churches that he did not start and had not visited before. But he did want to raise money for, uh, he was uh, looking for a trip to Spain. Part of the Jewish population in Rome at that time had been forced to leave in the late 40s because of an edict from uh, Emperor Claudius. You know, they like to stir things up a little bit, and those Roman emperors were not down with that. So they had gotten in trouble. They were kicked out of Rome. But Claudius died in the year 54, so um, six to eight years after they'd been kicked out, Emperor Nero, huh, that Nero, rescinded the decree so that those who had been expelled could come back home to Rome. Well, you have the Gentile Christians who were the ones who had not been kicked out. And they weren't particularly sad that the Jewish Christians had been kicked out because there had been, you know, some rumblings between them. And the Gentile Christians who had never had to leave felt that maybe God was on their side and the Jews were no longer a part of the covenant that God had made with Abraham. So in this letter, Paul uh, argues that he and other Jews are still under the obligation of this original covenant that God had made with the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, and that God keeps God's promises. That God is filled with righteousness, with love and grace. And now that they were all back together, the question was, how were they going to live in harmony with such different cultural traditions and taboos? Uh, the biggest being, of course, how did they eat together? Because this was a huge deal in Jewish uh, culture that uh, the food had to be clean, everyone had to wash them themselves in certain ways. There was a long list of things that were expected of you before you sat down to a meal. And if you were with people of a different culture, and you've seen it, you see, and you've probably done it before when you're with people who are from a different culture and they're eating differently, and you're like, oh my goodness. <laughs> or cool, <laughs> depending on uh, where you're at with that. But this was a hard thing. This was real. This was what was happening in Rome. And Paul says in this letter, he uses my very favorite seminary word, adiaphora, which is a Greek word for it doesn't matter. This is why this pastor will never decide on the color of the carpet <laughs> or the windows or any of that. I will leave those decisions to you because to me, adiaphora doesn't matter. So for Paul, there are things that we can disagree on and still be Christian. 
So in the first eight chapters of Romans, there are these deep, deep arguments that you really have to follow, and you really kind of have to know your history to understand what he's talking about. But he's making these deep arguments of Christian and Jewish thought about uh, creation and Adam and Eve and the fall and the covenant and Torah and Israel's failure to maintain the covenant. And then he moves into this idea that the death and resurrection of Jesus are God's answer to these complex problems that they are talking about in short, really in short, because it's a long letter, y'all. All is guaranteed with the love of God. When we come to faith, we rise with Christ into a new multicultural community where all ethnic groups and races are equal and beloved. And in the, in the passage right before uh, what Dory read for us today, it says, so what are we going to say? Should we continue sinning so grace will multiply? Absolutely not. All of us died to sin. How can we still live in it? But N.T. Wright, who is a wonderful, wonderful um, translator, says this. It should instead say, we are people whose main characteristic is precisely that we have died to sin. We are people characterized by cross and resurrection, dying and rising. We don't belong to death. We don't wait until bodily resurrection to walk in the light. We are already walking with Christ, and it's up to us to live like that. We are baptized people. We are raised. And we are to walk with a new quality of life because we are God's own We are forgiven. You can let that go. The future is assured that we will rise, whatever that looks like. And in Paul's view, when we are baptized, we leave behind the old ways and grace wins. I don't know about you, but I have friends. I have a friend who in her 60s was explaining to me how guilty she felt Because when she married her husband 40 years ago, she had been with another man before that. 40 years she was living with a guilt that does not matter. We can let that go, my gosh, y'all. So if you are holding on to some secret shame or guilt, you don't have to, friends. You can give that up. You can say, enough. I'm going to live so God can use me. Amen? So what are those implications, friends? It is immense. It is endless. We can emerge to be our truest selves. We can offer our lives to justice and peace. We can learn new ways of being with one another. We are not tied to our political parties. We are tied to Christ, to love, to resurrection. So let us live like that and leave the shame and guilt behind. Amen? Amen. Amen. I just feel like doing a little. (laughs) Feeling that today, y'all. Feeling it. Well, the word always calls us to respond. And part of our response is always to pray for one another, to be a community that cares about one another, the people who've been here forever, and the people who are visiting for the first time. But I have to say, I would like to start with a prayer from Diana Butler Bass that she wrote this morning after um, our latest mass shooting in Texas last night. Will you pray with me? God of plowshares, We confess our need to face the misery, brutality, and evil of gun violence in the United States of America. Family, friends, and neighbors, children, and adults are being slaughtered by those with powerful weapons and powerful interests to ignore the suffering. We have failed you. We have failed them. Have mercy on us. We grieve with the scores of thousands whose loved ones have been murdered in mass shootings and in too many other shootings across this nation. We ask you to heal the injured, those whose bodies will be wounded forever, and those whose hearts are broken. 
We pray for all those living with the shock, trauma, and fear of these horrors. Oh God, deliver this nation from anxiety and anger. Strengthen the resolve of voters, activists, policymakers, judges, and political leaders. Fill us with courage to change the laws that govern our communities so we may dwell in safety again. Free us all from the idolatry of guns. May we lay down every weapon and wield only compassion and love as resurrected people. Send your spirit of concord among us. May we stand as peacemakers in this time of anguish and sorrow. Our mission focus for the month of May is Compassionate Care Ministries. Compassionate Care seeks to offer those that are houseless in Central Oregon with things like gas, with things like a birth certificate, helping them pay for these uh, unexpected expenses that might pop up for them. Know that every dollar you give that isn't designated this month toward the church will go directly to Compassionate Care and to help those in need. You know, Jesus and his friends collected what the crowd offered and there was enough food for all. Let us live in the legacy of the living Christ, sharing what we have that all may have enough. There are three ways that you can give here to Ben Church. The first way would be using the app Venmo. The second way would be to click on the giving tab on our website to access our online giving with e-offering, or you may mail a check to our secure mailbox here at the church. Now, please join me as we give thanks for the gifts that we will receive this week. Anti-Nazi German poet Bertolt Brecht famously wrote, In the dark times will there also be singing. Yes, there will also be singing about the dark times. God be with us. Bless our shared resources to solidarity amidst systems of violence Bless our offerings to our soulful songs. Amen.
Now receive this benediction. Now go into your lives, stretch and yawn and begin to stir, awakening to the beauty of the world around you and saying yes to all the second chances that bring you back to life. And may the assurance of the God who created you, the Christ who is raising you, and the Spirit that will unleash you be with you now and always. Blessed be and amen.